Hi everyone, and welcome to the first installment of a new way to learn Rust. We're going to be looking through blog posts and reading them out and then maybe having a small discussion. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, this one here called string versus ampersand stir in Rust functions. Now don't be confused by the date. It is dated the 3rd of May 2015. Uh, it's still extremely relevant. Herman J. Radke, the third, uh, wrote this a few years ago now. And uh, so we'll just explain a little bit about who he is. He's the organizer of the Rust Los Angeles meetup and uh, has a background in sociology. I'll have links to his site and this blog post uh, in the description below. String versus ampersand stir in Rust functions. For all the people frustrated by having to use the toString method to get programs to compile, this post is for you. For those not quite understanding why Rust has two string types, string and ampersand stir, I hope to shed a little bit of light on the matter. Functions that accept a string. I want to discuss how to build interfaces that accept strings. I'm an avid hypermedia fan and am obsessed about designing interfaces that are, that are easy to use. Let's start with a method that accepts a string. Our search hints that standard string string is a good choice here. We've got two functions in a code listing. Print me has one argument, message string. Its body is the print line macro the message is uh, brackets and then single argument message. The second function in the small code snippet is the main function where we define our own message using string literals and then we try to print it. This gives a compiler error. Uh, expected collections string string, but we found ampersand uh, single quote static stir. So, a string literal is a type ampersand stir that does not appear to be compatible with the type string. We can change the message type to a string and compile successfully. Do that with let message equals hello world in double quotes to string. Uh, open close parens semicolon. This works but it is analogous to using the clone method to get around ownership and borrowship borrowing errors. Here are three reasons to change print me to accept a stir instead. Reason one, the ampersand symbol is a reference type, which means we are borrowing the variable. When print me is done with the variable, ownership will return to the original owner. Unless we have a good reason to move the ownership of the message variable into our function, we should elect to borrow. Using a reference is much more efficient. Using string with a capital S for message means that the program must copy the value. When using a reference such as ampersand stir, no copy is made. A string type can be magically turned into an ampersand stir type using the deref deref trait and time coercion. This will make much more sense with an example. Next section, example of deref co coercion. This example creates strings in four different ways that all work with the print me function. The key to making this all work is passing values by reference. Rather than passing owned underscore under, rather than passing owned underscore string as a string with a capital S to print me, we instead pass it as an ampersand string. When the compiler sees a ampersand string being passed to a function that takes an ampersand stir small s t r, it coerces the ampersand string into an ampersand stir. 
This same coercion takes place for the reference counted and atomically reference counted strings. The string variable is already a reference, so no need to use an ampersand when calling print me string. Knowing this, we no longer have a to string method calls. Knowing this, we no longer need to have dot to string calls littering our code. Next code listing. It has two functions. The first is a small implementation of print, print me. And this time the message argument takes an ampersand stir, which we can also describe, we can also call a string slice. It then, uh, the body of the print me method, uh, sorry, print me function takes a, is a, an invocation of the print line macro with the string literal message equals and our two curly braces and then our single argument message close brace uh, sorry close parens and semicolon and that is the entire body of print me the main function is longer its first line is let string equals hello world we have a string vari a variable named string and a string literal assigned to that variable. We then call print me with that variable. And then we, uh, in the third line, we say let owned underscore, underscore string equals hello world in double quotes as a string literal. To, and then we call the to string method on that literal. The print me method, sorry, the print me function is then called again this time with the new variable own string and a reference to that string. Uh, so the syntax there is print me open parens ampersand own, un, owned string close parens semicolon. The third example is, or the third part of the main function is a different type. So we create a new variable called counted string with the syntax let counted underscore string equals stud or standard. Then we use the RC module and then the RC type with a capital R. Uh, the, and then we call the static method new. Again with uh, a string that is defined first with a double quoted hello world uh, string literal and then with the two string method called upon it. Close the parens and use a semicolon. Print me with an ampersand counted string works. And then the final example in, in this long main function is a different type uh, with a new variable name called atomically counted string atomically underscore counted underscore string equals standard sync arc ARC with a capital A and then there's a static method and then hello world again uh, that's called with a and then print and and after that print me is called with an ampersand preceding the variable name that's the end of the example. You can also use deref coercion with other types, such as vector. After all, a string is just a vector of 8 byte chars or cars. This is a slight correction. <laughs> that isn't technically correct. This is kind of like editorial term speaking. Uh, we can talk about, um, can increase the precision there. Um, it's more strictly correct to say that a string is a vector of u8, which is a single byte um, value that is defined, is guaranteed to be utf8 encoded. You can read more about deref coercions in the Rust Lang book. Next section, introducing struct. At this point, we should be free of extraneous two-string calls for our functions. However, we run into some problems when we would like to introduce a struct. 
Using what we just learned, we might take a struct like this. The code example has struct person with a single field name, colon, ampersand, stir, or a string slice. And our, and then the next stanza of the example is a main function where a variable is defined, let underscore person equals person curly brace, open curly brace, name, colon, Herman. Uh, so we're creating a person object or person struct, and its name field is being assigned to uh, the a string literal Herman. And then uh, close curly brace, semicolon. We get an error. We're missing a lifetime specifier. Rust is trying to ensure that person does not outlive the reference to name. If person did manage to outlive name, then we risk our program crashing. The whole point of Rust is to prevent this. So let's start trying to get this to compile. We need to specify a lifetime or scope so that Rust can help keep us safe. Just as another side note, that is a good way to explain lifetimes, but it's not technically correct. I'll add another link at the bottom of the, uh, in the description of this video, um, or in the show notes in the podcast version, uh, about a, another a more precise way to um, explain what lifetimes are. The conventional lifetime specifier is single quote A. I do not know why this was picked, uh, but let's go with that. So now there's a new code example. We have a struct defined uh, with a, a person is defined again. Now we have a single field name, colon, and then the data type is defined as ampersand single quote a space str comma. So we have a single field in our person struct and then a main function is called again. Unfortunately, uh, sorry, and the, the, the main function mirrors the first um, main function. That is, we are creating a new variable from the person struct. Compile again and get another error. And the error message reported out is use of undeclared lifetime single quote, single quote A. Let's think about this. We know we want to hint to the Rust compiler that our struct person should not outlive name. So we need to declare our lifetime on the person struct. Some searching around will point us to the less than, sing, uh, less than single quote A greater than being the syntax to declare lifetimes. So now the code example is just slightly modified again. We define our person struct. This time, next to person, we have uh, a less than symbol, single quote, and a greater than symbol. The uh, name field remains the same, and so does the main function itself. And then, hooray, this compiles. We normally implement methods on our structs though. Let's add a greet function to our person class. Another code example. There is a struct person, an implementation or an impl block, uh, and our impl person with a single, a single method greet defined as fn space greet, uh, open parens, ampersand, self, close parens. Inside the body of the greet method is the print line macro, so that's print line exclamation mark, and then open parens, a string literal, hello, my name is curly brace, this is, and then uh, double quote again, and that takes a single argument, self.name. Close parens, semicolon. 
The main function is very similar, except we now call the grep method. So we'd first define the function main with fn space main, and uh, it takes no argument, so there's just open close parens. Let the body of the main function is let person equals person with a capital P. The name is Herman, as we've seen before. The calling invoking the method is person dot greet, open close parens, and then semicolon. Now we get the error. Error. Wrong number of lifetime parameters. Expected one found zero. And then there is a specific pointer to the implementation block. Our person struct has a lifetime parameter so that our implementation should have it too. Let's declare our a lifetime or our single quote a lifetime to the implementation of person like impl person less than single quote a greater than. Uh, unfortunately, this gives us a confusing error when we compile. Uh, use of undeclared variable name, uh, undeclared lifetime name, uh, single quote a. In order for us to declare the lifetime, we need to specify the lifetime right after the impl, like impl less than single quote a greater than person. Compile again and we get the error. Wrong number of lifetime parameters. So some expected one found zero. Impl less than, so and then a pointer to the um, specific location. Impl less than single quote a greater than person. Now we're back on track. Let's add back our lifetime parameter back to the implementation of person, like impl less than single quote a greater than person less than single quote a per, <laughs> greater than. <laughs> and then that's a uh, curly, curly brace. Now our program compiles. Here is the working code. Again, another code block. Uh, we have a person struct with uh, a lifetime parameter this time, a lifetime a, this a single field name with uh, that takes a string slice with the lifetime uh, a, an impl block that is a, uh, <clears throat> that defines a lifetime a, and person that actually uses that, um, that declared lifetime, a greet method has exactly the same. The main method is all, uh, sorry, the main function uh, is the third stanza of the code example, and it's also the same. Next section, string, or string slice, that is ampersand str instruct. The question is now whether to use a string or a string slice, that is an ampersand str in your struct. In other words, when should we use a reference to another type in a struct? We should use a reference if our struct does not need ownership of the, um, We should use a reference if our struct does not need ownership of the variable. This concept might be a little vague, but there are some rules that I use to get at an answer. Do I need to use the variable outside of my struct? And here's a contrived example. So the contrived example is another code example with our, str our person struct. This time name is defined as a string. Uh, the person implementation is simpler. It doesn't have any lifetime parameters. And inside the main function is a, uh, a two variables. One is name. So let name equals string colon colon from stir and uh, left parens Herman uh, in double quotes, close parens, semicolon. And the second variable is person, which is defined as sort of let person equals, and then person the, with a capital P for the struct, and their name is the name. Uh, 
curly braces inside there as well as the semicolon. The meet method is, sorry, the greet method is called. And we also print out, uh, we have a print line, my name is, and then curly braces, and then the print line is attempting to reuse the main, the name variable defined in the first line of the main function. There's a quote there that says, move error. I should use a reference here since I need to use the variable later. Here is a real world example in Rust C Serialize with a link that through to uh, somewhere in the Rust source code. The encoder struct does not need to own the writer variable that it implements standard format write or stud fmt write. Just use, just borrow it for a while. Just use, that is, borrow it for a while. In fact, string implements write. In this example, using the encode function, the variable of type string is passed to the encoder and then returned to the caller of encode. Second rule, is my type large? If the type is large, then passing it by reference will save unnecessary memory usage. Remember that passing by reference does not cause a copy of the variable. Consider a string buffer that contains a large amount of data. Copying that will cause the program to be much slower. We should now be able to create functions that accept strings, whether they are a string slice, a string, or an event reference or event reference counted. We're also able to create structs that are able to have variables that are references. The lifetime of the struct is linked to those referenced variables to make sure that struct does not outlive the referenced variable and causing, let's, <laughs> let's try that one again. The lifetime of the struct is linked to those referenced variables to make sure that struct does not outlift the, the reference variable and cause bad things to happen in our program. We also have a initial understanding of whether or not the variables in our struct should be types or references of types. Next section. What about static? Random aside, but I thought it might be worth, but I thought it might be worth mentioning. We can use a single quote static lifetime to get our original example to compile, but I caution against it. So in this case, uh, we have our code example. Uh, we have defined person again with a single field name and a, uh, another string slice. And this time the string slices Lifetime parameter is static with single quote static. The person's implementation, uh, impl, the impl block is the same as uh, the version with the string. So that is, we just call a uh, print line and with double quotes, hello, my name is uh, open, close, curly brace, uh, and then self.name field. So it relates back to the name field in the person struct. And the main function itself looks very similar to what we've already seen. We define a variable using uh, the person struct that we created and uh, a string literal, uh, notably a string literal for uh, the name. And then we, we call greet. The static lifetime is valid for the entire program. You may not need person or name to live that long. Okay, that's the end of the recording. <laughs> Thanks very much, Herman, for uh, writing such a thorough post. Thanks, everyone, for making it this far through the recording. And also thanks to Herman for releasing uh, this article under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 international license. Thanks very much. If you have recommendations for... 
future posts or if you'd like your own post read out, um, please send me a note. Um, there'll be contact details in the description. Thanks very much. Take care.